morning, church. All right, that wasn't too bad. We're going to be in 1 Peter, so please turn there, as Ben had just mentioned on the video. And we're going to dig into verses 3 through 5 this morning. But most of all, I hope that your week has been filled with the hope that we've talked about the last few weeks. We've come out of this Easter season, Resurrection Sunday, and we've really centered on the fact that Christ brings us hope. And as he brings us hope, it should change how we live each and every day. It should change our perspectives. And my prayer this morning is we dig into the next little piece here in 1 Peter chapter 1, that he continues, God continues to change our perspective on what's going on in the world around us, on what's going on in our own lives, and in how we're seeing everything based upon his resurrection hope. So I hope that we can be able to do that again this morning. We're going to read in a minute uh, the first five verses. So we'll read verse 1 through 5 in 1 Peter chapter 1. But I just want to give us a brief recap before we do that uh, to talk about what we looked at last week that kind of set the table. We did an introduction last week, covered the first two verses, but it's kind of Peter's setting of the table for the whole letter that he writes to the exiles who are looking for hope but don't see it right in front of them. And Peter's trying to encourage them in that. We talked about three things that we're encouraged in our hope. First, we can have hope because the Father knows us. As it says in the first few verses, he has known us before the foundations of the world, and he has planned our steps in every way from then until now and everything going forward. So he knows us. He has that kind of foreknowledge that we can have hope in. Secondly, the Spirit grows us. We have hope because the Spirit is at work in our lives in the process of sanctification that it says there in verse 1 and 2. That he is sanctifying us as we go. The Spirit is working in our lives. And then thirdly, we have hope because the Son leads us. So the Father, the Spirit, and the Son all active in this resurrection hope that we have. And we're called to obedience as he leads us forward. Our hope lies in the character of God himself. So we need to be really careful with this, especially as we continue to go forward. We want to make sure that we are fixing our hope on the right thing. And that's what Peter is trying to press into these believers that are scattered all over the place through Asia, Turkey, and all modern-day Turkey, and all these places. He is trying to press into their hearts to continually remind them that hope is only foundational and can only be secured for eternity if it is fixed on the right thing, and that is the work of God. So as we talk about the character of God, we talk about the fact that he reveals him to us, he reveals himself to us in a Trinitarian way. And that's one of the things that Peter jumps right into here. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit, all active in our hope as we go. A couple of weeks ago, uh, we spent our time in a series that talked about the cross-shaped life. And one of the things that we centered on and repeated as we went throughout that, I want to touch on just briefly again this morning as we dig in. The understanding of the gospel, Jesus' miraculous birth, sinless life, saving death, and victorious resurrection, that truth reminds us of these two congruent things that, happen, that are happening in our lives. We are simultaneously more sinful than we'll ever admit or would imagine. But at the same time, we are more loved than we could ever fathom or hope for. And as we press in, one of the things I want to be reminding myself first and all of us together as a church family is this. Our hope will be attacked in different ways. There are opportunities in our lives where our hope could, if we are not careful and if we are not diligent, if we are not faithful and obedient, that our hope gets shaken and it moves because we fix it in different things or we allow ourselves to go in different directions. But if we fix ourselves on the understanding of God, while we are sinful, he died for us. While we are more sinful than we'll imagine or admit, he is more loving and gracious and we are more loved and accepted than we could ever imagine. Those truths will draw us back to who he is. It's God's character that we fix ourselves on. It's God's character that we focus on. It's God's character that holds our hope. If you're anything like me, probably throughout the last week, you've had some opportunities to continue to remind yourself of where your hope is held. So life has a tendency of doing this. If you aren't too diligent, if you're not too focused, we have a tendency to get distracted. And sometimes we get distracted and we take our hope, which is fixed on the foundation of God as Christians, and we might move it over a little bit onto things of this world onto our circumstances, 
onto the circumstances of those around us, onto things that we were looking for in our lives that may or may not actually come into our lives. And if our hope gets distracted into that, and you've probably had opportunities this week to trust the Lord in your circumstances, I would almost guarantee it, if we can remind ourselves in those moments to look back to him and look forward in what he's doing for us and secure for us, we will continue to be able to grow in him and live the lives he's called us to. So the truth that Peter gives to the scattered first century church and the Christians that he cares about and loves and is built into, but have been sent all over the place, that same truth is the truth that guides and directs and holds us today. It's the same truth. It hasn't changed. So 1 Peter is not just for those that it was directly written to in the first century. It's for us, even now. Three areas that we talked about splitting this book up to, into, and we're going to focus on the first section today. God's grace and salvation, chapters 1 and 2. God's grace and submission, the second part of chapter 2, and then into 3. And then God's grace and suffering, which covers the rest of Peter's letter here. God's grace and salvation, God's grace and submission, and God's grace and suffering. The grace of God, as Peter writes, in their salvation, but I want us to take that phrase and actually put our salvation into there too. The grace of God in our salvation should give them and us hearts and attitudes of submission and in the context of suffering for the name of Christ. So these main three words that we looked at last week that we're going to focus on as we go forward, salvation, submission, and suffering, is what Peter's bringing to us. All right, let's dig in. First Peter chapter 1. You guys ready to go to work? That was not reassuring. Okay, are we ready to go to work? Okay, First Peter chapter 1. We're going to read the first five verses, so read along with me. Look in your Bibles, follow along. First Peter Chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles in the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. May God bless the reading of his word this morning and, and bless us as we start to dig in and see what he has for us. Whenever we go to God's word, whenever we're, we're asking ourselves what God is doing in our lives or showing us or leading us through, I want to encourage us to ask some key questions. These four key questions are also answered in the first 10 verses of this chapter. And one of the things I'll challenge you with, this might be a good place to write these questions down. I know you probably have them in your app if you're taking notes in there. But these questions can be applied at almost any point in your life when you're trying to walk with the Lord well and figure out what he's doing in your life. No matter your age, no matter your experience of walking in the faith, these are important questions for understanding the gospel and what God's doing. The first one is this, who is God? Whenever we're trying to walk well with the Lord, whenever we're trying to understand how the gospel applies to our lives, the first question is always, who is God? And Peter starts right into this letter by telling us who God is. He describes him as Trinitarian in these first two verses, and he tells us what our relationship with him should be like. So God's character being revealed immediately to us in verse two. The second question is, what has he done? And that's where we get into today. We'll dig our way through verses three through five that are answering for us not only who God is, but God always works out of his character. If we understand his character and know his character, we will recognize his working. So the first question of who is God, the second one is what, what has he done? The third one, who does that make me to be? Verse two and three answer that as an identity statement for us. Who is it that God tells us we are? In this passage, we are born again, we are heirs, we are guarded, and there is more as we go forward. 
But we have to be careful not to jump too far forward into us. Because what we want to protect ourselves against as followers of Christ, as those who have been made new in him, is we don't want ourselves to get fixed on our spiritual walk being about me. It's not about me. It's about God. So we have to ask the right questions first in order to get the right answers first in order to lead us into the right way of living. So who God is in his character, what he has done, which always works out of his character, makes us who we are. And then the fourth question, the last one, how do I live in light of these truths? We always have to connect the dots dots there to not just be hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word. So we have to take who God is and what he's done and who that makes us to be and not stop there. Take it through the end that God's called us to actually live in light of all that he's shown us. Peter does that so well for us here. He does it in these first few verses and he continues to do it as he goes forward in this letter, reminding the believers of who they are in him and what he has done for them. And then lastly, how do you live? You see this even in the major sections as we broke the book down. Salvation, first. What has God done? What is his character led him to do for us? Then submission to that, understanding who he is and who that's made us to be. And then lastly, in this particular context, Peter writes into the suffering of the church. Because how you live in the midst of suffering is a reflection of who you think you are. It's a reflection of what you believe about God's character. So all that to say, we want to start to pull this out and help ourselves be reminded continually of the truth of God's word and what he's done for us. Verse three is where we're going to start. So verse three, Peter opens up by before he even gets into, and and you'll see before he gets into what he really knows the people are dealing with as they're scattered, and he reminds them that this is not their home, but heaven is their home. But before he even digs into this idea of suffering and homesickness and this, this angst that is the people are living with as they're scattered throughout, before he digs into that at all, the first thing he does is he blesses God. This is a great example for us. How well do we do that as people? Do we bless God in the midst of every circumstance? Whether we're here in the, the building that we use to gather the church together and we get to sing and praise and it's, it's a little bit easier to bless the Lord right here on a Sunday morning, right? We have wonderful songs we're singing. We're being encouraged in prayer. We're digging into God's word. We're with the church family. But do you bless the Lord in everything? In every circumstance he gives you to walk through? Peter starts right in. He could have just said, hey, listen, I know that life's been really hard. Let's dig into that. But that's not where he starts. He starts by blessing the Lord. It's a great example for us. It's a great way to start our days, our weeks, everything. It's a wonderful way for us to be reminded of who God is by starting off with blessing the Lord. And he says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is to be blessed. God's to be blessed when you feel it, and God's to be blessed when you don't feel it. God's to be blessed when your circumstances in your life is going the right direction, and the way that you think it should go, and the way that you've planned for it to go, and God is to be blessed when we are scattered and suffering and not in the place that we want it to be. God's to be blessed in all of those circumstances, and in everywhere in between. One of the best disciplines that I think we can have as people who are seeking to grow in the Lord is realizing every single day how much God has blessed us. I mean, no matter what the circumstances you've had to deal with this past week, we are some of the most blessed people in the world. And if we choose to take that perspective continually, The growth part, the part where the Spirit sanctifies and moves us forward in our walk with him comes at a much smoother rate when we start by blessing him. Peter gives us that example right in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He then goes on right out of that blessing to give us one one of my favorite passages of Scripture that just clearly, concisely tells us this is what God has done. According to his great mercy, 
He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's the gospel. It's right here. It's tangible. When you're walking with others in this world, when you're interacting with people who don't yet know Jesus and you're trying to encourage them or share the gospel with them, don't get too tricky. Just be clear. Be clear. Peter is abundantly clear with these exiles who have been through a lot. They have been sent out into all these places away from Jerusalem, not able to gather with the larger throng of believers that they want to be with. They are out there. They're feeling alone. They're homesick for what they want in this world, their earthly comforts. And Peter's here to remind them heavenly comforts are better than earthly comforts. Therefore, we can not only bless the Lord, we can be reminded of what he's done. And I know sometimes there's a term in the middle of this verse that gets a little sketchy and people feel uncomfortable with this idea of being born again. Now, I understand that sometimes that gets hard to kind of relay that to people around us that may not be in Christ and experience new life. But here's one of the things we have to remember. God, in his infinite wisdom, uses exactly the words that he wants us to hear. There is the old life, there is the life that we live apart from Christ that is difficult and broken and sinful and without the hope that he provides. And then there is the new life. Reborn into a new life. Every time I see these two words, born again, I think of the conversation that Jesus has with Nicodemus, right? And Nicodemus is struggling. <laughs> and he's like, look, what do you mean, what do you mean born again? I can't go back into my mother's womb and I don't understand what you're talking about. And Jesus just simply, clearly calls him to the fact that in me, you can have new life. Not physical, spiritual there is new life. This idea that he has in his great mercy caused us to be born again. If we miss the fact that we have new life, we will act and live like we're still in the old life. When we're not. Those who have followed Christ and that he's brought into the family of God through faith and that the spirit has sanctified and is working in our lives, we are not the same people we used to be. And that is the same if you were saved when you were 40, 50, 60, or 7, 8, 12. It doesn't matter. This speaks to all of us. I was raised in the church. My father was a pastor. I had heard about Jesus from the youngest age, probably before I knew what they were saying to me. But the fact that I probably came into faith around eight years old, began to understand that more and more as I went into my teenage years and as I grew, it doesn't mean that without Christ, I wasn't broken and of the old life. I was. Was I young? By God's grace, God got the gospel to me early. But by God's grace, he gets the gospel to the rest of us later. And this idea of being born again is the challenge from this first couple sentences. God says through his son, you must be born again. Not in a weird way. Nicodemus was trying to make sense of it. He was like, what? I don't, does it make sense? It just comes down to this simple truth. God uses the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit to make things new. He makes things new. All the brokenness, he heals and reestablishes in newness. All the doubt, he turns to belief. This world we live in that looks a mess and is a mess and is broken, he is making things new. How? Through his people, through his church. Making things new. Peter emphasizes this because he wants people to understand before we get into talking about how you can have hope in the difficult circumstances you're in, you need to remember who you are. You are born again. New. Not the old, the new. He goes forward. 
Not only are you born again, but he describes it in a greater way for us in the last part of verse three. He says, you are born again to a living hope. And that is where we're centering because Peter keeps coming back to this idea of hope. And frankly, the people he's writing to don't have a lot of hope right in front of them. They are in some ways feeling hopeless. They don't know if they'll ever get back to what they know and love. They don't know if they'll ever be able to be around probably some of their family and extended loved ones. They're scattered throughout. They're the exiles. And they're feeling homesick. And he says, you have been born again to a living hope. How? Through the next phrase. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Don't, don't let that phrase just go right by you. You've been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The tomb is empty. Therefore, you and I don't have a dead hope that has a lifespan. We have a hope that is eternal, to never end. He goes on to describe in a minute about this as an inheritance, this living hope. Jesus, we celebrated this on Easter Sunday. We talked about this on Easter Sunday. Hopefully it is a truth that changes every day. The fact that he has risen from the dead changes everything. Changes everything. There's nothing that's the same after the resurrection because death is defeated. The hardest thing in life has been conquered by the greatest one to ever live. Jesus, because of the resurrection from the dead, we don't have a hope that has an end date. We don't have a hope that we have to kind of struggle with thinking it's still there and it's still true. No, it is a living hope. What happens with things that are living? They grow. Living things grow. That's the kind of hope that we should have in our lives. And if you don't have that currently, this is what I would encourage you to do. First, bless God regularly. Build in something in a routine in your spiritual life where you are blessing the Lord. And as you bless the Lord, then ask him, please grow my hope. It's a living hope. Living things grow. They multiply. They spread. The kind of hope that God brings to us through his son is a living one. How do we know that? Because Jesus came out of the grave. And he lives forever. And he's at the right hand of the Father. He's secured for us all that we need. So that in verse 4, we look at this. We've been raised into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ to inde- from the dead to an inheritance. Underline that word if, you're, if you take notes in your Bible or make a note of it somewhere. An inheritance. That's an identity statement for us as followers of Christ. Because who gets an inheritance? We can interact a little bit. Who gets an inheritance? Kids, children. Those who are far from God have then been brought in and adopted as sons and daughters, recipients of an inheritance. It's not just an easy word that Peter throws in there. It's a very rich, theologically deep word that should encourage us in our spiritual lives. We have an inheritance. And then he describes for us the greatness of this inheritance as he goes forward. This inheritance is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Peter, I, I think as I'm, Walking this through, I was reading one of our commentators that kind of identified with where I was looking at and digging into this particular sentence. Peter's having a hard time describing what that inheritance is. The only really words he has is to describe what it's not. Why? Because Peter hasn't been there yet. He hasn't tangibly seen it. But he does know that because it's a living hope and the inheritance comes from the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, that it's different than anything else you and I have ever seen. So he just majors on that. He gives us three defining words that basically say this kind of inheritance is unlike any inheritance you know of. It's completely different. He starts in by using these words to describe the fact that this inheritance is imperishable imperishable, cannot be destroyed. 
It's not overtaken by hostile elements. It doesn't decay, and there's nothing that can ruin it. It's imperishable. Think about that for a second, because you and I don't know anything that's imperishable. Is there anything that you can describe that's imperishable in this world? Everything here decays over time. Everything falls apart. Why do we have all these hero stories? If you ever watch, and I don't know if you're into these or not, but every hero story that you could ever kind of watch on cinema or read in a book or watch in a play, they all have this one common thing. The idea of pushing towards immortality. Getting rid of the fact that things get broken down and decay. One of the most recent ones, if you think about Marvel movies and all the superhero movies, this idea of uh, whether it's a super soldier, somebody that can't be hurt, or these superheroes that are otherworldly, that don't age. Why, are they, why is that in all of our narratives? It's in our narratives because that's what we long for. We long for it. We try to put earthly terms to it. We try to kind of make sense of it. But what we really long for is something that is completely imperishable and will never decay. And God's the only one that gives us that. His inheritance for us in heaven, that future hope of glory that he's secured for us in Christ, it is the only imperishable thing that you'll know. Because it's from God, it's not from us. Won't decay, nothing can ruin it. Undefiled is the second word he uses here. Cannot be defiled by pollution from the outside. That's the definition of that word. Cannot be defiled by pollution from the outside. It can't be stained. It will not be cheapened. It will not be lessened. It is undefiled. So as we're thinking about this inheritance, if you think about earthly inheritance, one of the things you're always trying to do is make sure that any earthly inheritance is kind of accruing, right? Getting bigger instead of getting smaller. But it's a constant fight, no matter where you put that inheritance. It's wealth or possessions or whatever to keep it from actually decaying or getting defiled. So in the absence of an accurate description of our future hope that he can really put his hands on and describe to them, he describes how it's different than anything you know, you and I know. Imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. The third word he uses here, it cannot fade by wasting from within and will not lose its beauty. Will not lose its beauty. It will never grow old. See, this inheritance that God has for us should give us an, a living, eternal hope because it's unlike anything else you or I know of. It's completely different. It's imperishable, it's undefiled, and it's unfading. As he goes into verse 5, he says, and it's kept in heaven for us, for you and I. So before we dig into verse five, let's just look at these three distinct movements that, Paul, that Peter is re relaying to the people he's writing to and to us. He's talking about the past, the present, and the future hope. The past recollection of this is he's writing to believers. So as he writes to Christians, he says, he has caused you to be born again, past tense. He's drawn you in. He's adopted you. He's caused you to be born again. That's the past reality of what God has done for those who are walking in him. But then he walks us into our present. Our present is the fact that we are sons and daughters with an inheritance. So God has changed the past he has rectified and redeemed it. He is working in the present. We are sons and daughters with an inheritance that we have because of him. And then he talks about the future. At the end of verse four, he says, kept in heaven for you. It's waiting. It's there. Verse five, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Our hope is because we understand the past in light of God. Our hope is because the present is currently being changed by God's work. And our hope is because the future is secured for us forever. This is an all-encompassing hope. It covers the past, the present, and the future. It's something that's unlike anything else you or I know 
or that we can kind of codger together in our places of finding hope in this world. Because it's not of this world. It's of heaven. And it's a future hope in the glory that he has secured for us. This last idea of this future hope that is being held for us. At the end of verse four, it's, there's this word, it says kept, kept in heaven for you. And as I dug in a little bit of that word, that this word is a military term. And it's a military term that Peter uses here. It's the idea of being guarded. But the, the tense of this particular verb, kept, is a present and future tense. So it, it's the fact that it is being guarded and will continue to be guarded. So God guards this for us currently and will continue to guard it until we're there. And then he goes on to describe the next part. Who by God's power are being guarded. So our inheritance is being guarded and we are being guarded. Through faith for a salvation to be revealed in the last time. Our inheritance in heaven will not be lost. It will not be confused. It won't be canceled. It makes me think of that. I don't know if you're Seinfeld watchers or not, but there's that particular episode where uh, Jerry and Elaine are in the car uh, rental office and they're having this discussion and they come in and they give them the reservation and they say, we don't have any cars. So, well, that's the point of a reservation, right? So there's a car. So, they get in this long just debate, right? And they're back and forth. And the only thing that he keeps saying is, isn't that the point of a reservation, right? That it's there when you get there. That it's held for you. And that makes me laugh every time I watch it. And it is so funny because, one, I've had that happen to myself before. And two, it's so different than what God does for us. Nobody's going to show up in heaven and have the reservation lost, when we get there, it's going to be there. Why? Because you and I don't hold on to the reservation. It's not our job. He holds the reservation. He will never lose it. It will not be canceled. Nobody's going to be confused when those who are in Christ, sons and daughters, show up for their inheritance. It's going to be clear. We can rely on it. We can live in light of it. It can change everything that we see and do. So these three verses, the three verses three, four, and five here that we're digging into, this is, all, again, as Peter does, Peter does this regularly, and whether it's his sermon in Acts or here in his letters, his epistles, he sets the foundation, he kind of lays it out for us, and then he transitions. After he knows that we've heard what we need to hear, then he transitions more to the circumstances that are surrounding us. But we as people want to jump right into our circumstances, don't we? Here's what that reveals. It reveals that our hope is in our circumstances. And if we can get them fixed, we'll have more hope. So as people of God, we need to repent from that. That's not just a misstep. That's actually wrong. That's sinful. To take what God has called us to, having hope in him and eternal glory that he's secured for us through his son, that he's working out in us through the spirit, and then take all of that wonderful hope and put it on some menial little temporary things that happen in this world. That's wrong. We need to repent from that and turn back to him again. I know it's not easy. I mean, I, I've, I've, we've had things in our own lives that are just difficult. And maybe you're there now. And you're in a circumstance where you're like, I don't see what God is doing. And when you don't see what God is doing, that's when you need to go back and remember what he's done. Go back and remember what he's secured so that we can live in times where we could very easily end up hopeless. But instead, we live right through those times with a hope fixed on a future glory that he's secured forever and that he will never lose, will not be defiled, is imperishable, is not going to fade and lose its worth. It's totally different and other than anything you and I know in this world. That's how good God is. And I'm convinced that in verse 3, as Peter opens, the reason he can open with, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, it's not because the circumstances were going perfectly. It's because he knew what he was going to say next about God's character and God's work. So because of that, 
we can bless the Lord. So prayerfully, we will be people that bless the Lord in everything. Knowing that no matter what we see in front of us, we know what the future holds. And that he holds it more securely than you and I ever could. So I'm really excited. This is kind of the the first little foundational piece before Peter kind of starts to unroll some more things that relate to the circumstances of the people he's writing to that are scattered, that are exiles, that are looking for their home. And Peter's reminding them it's in heaven. It's not here. So let's fix our hope on that. Let's prayerfully continue to read and spend our time in God's word as we go forward. I'm thankful this morning, not only for all of you that are gathered here, but for those who are online or that watch us later, because this is the reality. We, those who have come into Christ and are born again to a living hope, we are the body of Christ in this world. This world needs hope desperately. It doesn't take long to find that. People around us are hopeless in every way. We have what they're really looking for. Let's be people that live it and then declare it to them. Clearly, concisely, giving them an opportunity to respond in everything that we do. And if you're here this morning, whether in person or watching or listening, I would encourage you to examine your heart. If you have not come to a place where you have this kind of hope, don't wait. Do it right now. God is so much better than what I can stand up here and describe to you. And he wants you to live in light of all that he's done for you. Now, tomorrow, and for eternity.